Our third variation is hitting down, so each of these three variations is intended to give us the ability to strike at any point along a line. So they're not fixed techniques. You could strike up with a hammer fist to the groin, for example, the classic self-defense hammer fist to groin strike, or, well, you probably wouldn't strike down over the top with a hammer fist and the thumb, but nevertheless, anywhere that's feasible along a line of using this technique, you can use this technique by practicing these three variations, i.e. absolutely over the top, in from the top, and hit right directly down on top of the head. I can't imagine that you would ever do that, but certainly hitting in at an angle and down like this is really useful. For example, if someone's just a little bit off balance, you just catch them right in the neck, and you can just push them right off balance with it, or hit them, smash them right off balance. But one of the important things that we're learning now is how to be really engaged problem-solving learners. So taking the problematic of how to do the posture using our concept of open, close, rise and sink. And you would think that the solution here is just like all the other solutions that you just combine sink with open and that will give you the answer of how to stack this posture correctly. But it's not quite that easy. I've mentioned before that it's commonplace to find the old Wushu masters in the old texts talking about the idea that open contains close, close contains open, and so on. And also remember Yao Zongzun saying that Wushu should simply be natural principles expressed according to a particular need. So if the need is to get your knuckles down into the jawline of the opponent's face, you use planting fist or what we call an overhand these days. And if you were working out how to stack the planting fist, then the solution absolutely is 50% open, 50% sink. And that gives us this very interesting hybrid posture where at the hit point we're up on the pivot route. And this is in part a compromise because we're stacking the posture in such a way as to make it easier to get over the opponent's hand and down into the jawline. So we want to come up a little bit higher. And remember that as well as getting the striking area to the target, our main consideration is how to generate force and then how to transmit force. And remember also another important quintessence principle, which is that the strength of a posture is partially dependent on the strength of the target. So a jawline is quite a weak target as you're hitting down into it. So the power that you hit it with doesn't need to be enormous. And with the knuckles being a hard striking area, then you've got a little bit of wiggle room. So you don't need to absolutely use sink to drop all of your weight into the posture. You can compromise with the height so that you can get the posture to the right place. But as we've discussed in previous videos, the forearm strike is less powerful. It's a bigger posture, but because of that, there's more dissipation across the muscle alignment. In which case it tells us that making postures bigger can sometimes be a zero-sum game. Yes, you add more volume, but because you make the overall posture weaker, you lose some of the force transmission. And that's why a closer hook can be much more powerful than a big swinging hook. Or we would say in each one, a tighter muscle alignment versus a much weaker, bigger muscle alignment. And because of this, the ancient masters of Washu came to understand that although making a posture bigger can add volume volume itself is not the same thing as just making a posture bigger. And we can learn this really easily if you just hold your hand out in front of you and you just keep turning it palm up, palm down. You're adding more volume to the posture, but you're not making the posture any bigger. And this is exactly the same principle that screwing force is based on when we twist the arm into a punch. Or if you make that bigger into the phase of the whole movement of the body, then that's what we call spiral force. And we usually have both, so phased movement in the whole body, of which spiral force is a version, there's different versions, but phased movement in the body plus screwing force in the limbs, and that adds up to creating a lot more volume, but within a much neater, much more contained posture. But the stacking of the posture has to be adaptive. The overhand can transmit more force, but when we do the forearm strike, we lose a lot of force, so we have to compensate for that loss of force in some way. And we do that just like traditional Wushu by over-exaggerating contexts, in this case, sink and open. 
And that does various things, but one of the interesting knock-on effects of this is that we massively exaggerate open. In fact, we exaggerate open so much that it becomes close. So remember that close always contains open, open always contains close, as the old saying goes. And what we need to remember about that is that open and close are determined very simply by whether the hips are coming closer together, that's close, or whether the hips are opening, and that's open. So it doesn't matter whether it's the lead hip moving towards the back hip, that's still close, or whether it's the back hip moving towards the lead hip, that's still close. And when we combine open with sink very dramatically like this, then the lead hip curls back towards the rear hip, and that's close. And what we've done here is reversed the context, which is just one of those interesting anomalies that happens. It's not particularly difficult to get your mind around. And remember, this system is here to help us learn, but there will be these things that are a little bit more advanced. But intuitively and physically, you feel it when you do it, that this becomes close. And in technical terms, that's how a posture, a context, can dialectically reverse, i.e. it contains within it the seeds of its own opposite. So if you extend it to the extreme, then it becomes the opposite. And we call that context reversal. So let's start to look at some of the finer details. The first thing is this shifting of the weight back onto the rear leg, back into what would be called empty stance in traditional wushu. Notice the timing and the posture pushes up off the front foot onto the pivot root. And remember that the foot usually points towards the target like that. So it pushes up, the leg twists, and because the posture is skewed, it skews everything back onto the back leg. So watch the timing carefully. It has to lift up first. This is partly how we're going to generate force, just like before we used close into open. We're going to do that again, but lifting, rising, and then dropping into sync is a version of exactly the same thing. And this pushes you back onto your back leg, and this is a version of what in traditional wushu is called empty stance. However, the story isn't quite that simple, and things are always different when you do them at full speed. So if you look very carefully here at the pivot root, you'll see that, see that little press down as it hits, it doesn't maintain up in the pivot root. It pushes down, look, see how it pushes down, slams into the ground. So I'm using the pivot root to lift all of my weight up and then I'm slamming everything down with far lead back into the hard set with the lead foot. This is an interesting posture because it sets quite dramatically on both feet and we need to understand how that works. So let's start with our feet flat on the floor and the basic movement of the legs. So we're going to turn the hips forward and then we're going to drop backwards simultaneously. And the first thing that we need to understand here is that because we're using gravity, the only thing we can really do is push up a little bit from the other foot, which we're going to bring in when we use the pivot route. We can't drag ourselves towards the earth any faster with the rear leg. We can only relax the muscle and then drop a little bit and then suddenly tense the muscle again to kind of catch the posture. So in that moment, remember Yao Zung Zun saying the moment of release force is a weak point. Well, that absolutely is because you've got to untense the muscle and just kind of drop back. And if you can a little bit, just push up with the pivot root on the lead foot, try and push yourself back and also use the tilting of the quad to push down a little bit faster into the floor. And then what's going to happen is the whole structure of the back leg is going to compress. And this is what we call a compression set. And it's one of the most important ideas in each one. And if you're an each one fan and you haven't heard that concept before, it's just a transliteration, i.e. a more literal translation of Wang Shanjai's concept of rebound energy. And this is what happens, for example, if you hit a bag, a punch bag that's lighter, and you hit a punch bag that's heavier, but you hit them both with the same amount of force, the heavier one will feel and sound like you are hitting much harder. Reason being that the lighter bag is just going to give way, so it's going to dissipate a massive amount of the force. But if the bag is heavier, it can't dissipate that force, so the force has got to go somewhere, so it goes to the weakest part of the chain, which is you. And the heavier the object that you hit, the more your whole body will compress, and the more it compresses, the more it can transmit force. So you can say, in a way, it conducts, conducts force. Again, hard to say with my accent. It conducts, conducts force 
So that force goes into your body and then it's just a matter of how well you can rebound that energy back into the target. So in other words, it's not really rebounding, it's a matter of dissipation. So if the foot is hard set on the floor, the earth is not going to dissipate much energy. So it's got to go somewhere. And then it's a matter of how well you can manage your own structure to not dissipate force, to control it. And then more of that force will then go back into the target. So it just won't get dissipated. You'll magnify the effect of the hit. And we'll come back and look at that another time. But for now, we need to understand that we're not just releasing force against the hit point. We're releasing force down into the leg compressing the whole structure but the leg particularly and everything the movement of the body the torso is contributing to that and remember that balanced postures are not as useful for martial arts as unbalanced postures so single weighted postures are more useful than double weighted postures so we need to be really careful that we don't frogs like the posture and that's when we sit down into a kind of horse stance we want to ensure that everything is leaning backwards, even if that seems a little bit counterintuitive because it's going away from the hip point. Don't frogs like it. And we can see in this posture particularly because we use a sink how everything contributes to the compression set. The movement of the arm, the timing, everything just falls back onto that back leg, tries to intensify the compression of the posture to transmit more of the kinetic force. Then when we add in the pivot's root for all the reasons that we've discussed so far, we also find that that can contribute something to this because by lifting it up and then simultaneously pivoting the quad back, we can push back down a little bit. So it does give us a little bit of brace to push against to make the drop a little bit faster. Next, we can, if we like, do what we were doing with the other postures, which is to add in close first to add volume to the posture. But to be honest, that's an unnecessary adjustment. And it's one of those things that feels good when you do it slow, but when you do it fast doesn't really work because you're going from close with the rear hip to close with the lead hip. And that's very awkward posture to do. However, you do need to practice it because if you change from doing a single posture to a double posture, for example, a punch with the rear hand first, then you do need this. It's called complementary rooting. And it's how we flow fluidly from one posture into the next with a phased movement. So we do need it, but I wouldn't really do it for the posture on its own. On its own, I'd just go for it. And it's very opportunistic because I want to knock someone over if possible with this. That's one of the reasons to use it. So you don't want to be wasting time with it. And just like we did with the other postures, we take that movement that was in the qua from the close and we transfer it up into the shoulders and the use of the screwing force in the rear arm. We try and cultivate that to a higher level. As part of that process, we also change the angle that the rear arm is pulling down at. So remember, movement on the left begins on the right and we want that explosive movement with screwing force. You can see how it adapts to the posture that we're doing it changes the angle so for this one it's going to go down and pull everything down a little bit like a salute that's what i was demonstrating there that's how you can get the right angle on it and then we're just missing one more thing because everything changes when we do it faster or with full power so as i'm demonstrating it here slowly and without power it's easy just to keep that pivot route up in fact we don't want that we want to time our posture so that the lead pivot root actually slams down into the floor as we hit down. And remember that timing is a key aspect of cultivation, particularly when we're using these phased and spiral movements. They're not all happening at the same time. This takes a lot of practice, so we need to time this perfectly so that the compression set then flows into the hard set on the lead foot. And the lead foot's going to slam down like a split second afterwards at the end of the phase. And that's going to hit down like you're trying to crack a stone with your heel. And so even though in your mind you're trying to do one explosive simultaneous movement with your body, you're trying to get that timing of one, two, one, two. The initial movement, the compression set down, and then that hard set following just a split second later, and that will be the hit point. And because it's stabilizing the posture more, it will also increase the power transmission. And if you're wondering why we don't do that with a jab for example or a lead punch well the pivot root in the lead posture in that case adds extra velocity into the posture and stabilizes the posture but it mostly sets down onto the back leg so it doesn't really make any difference in terms of power transmission and remember that a jab for example is using rise not sink so 
we've reversed the context for the lead hand. It's using close and sync, whereas the jab is using open and rise. And that's an idiosyncrasy that we can exploit in a different way by using the compression set and the hard set on the front foot. And one final tweak in the power generation, we've moved the movement in the qua, the initial close into open that we did in the other postures. We've moved all of that into the shoulders and we do a bit of a shimmy. And even though we've reversed the contexts, this is just the standard shimmy that we would do, for example, for a cross jab, a posture that finishes with the lead hand. And just like those postures, the knacky thing is getting the screwing force with the rear hand to time with it perfectly and then to time it with everything else. You don't have to overthink it, it will just come like that naturally. It's just understanding what it is that you're doing on a more scientific level. In any case, all that's left then is not to wear out our body doing these postures full power millions of times over. Remember that we do a massive amount of our work just doing the postures slow, just catching the feeling slowly, building up whole body interconnectivity, working on the programming before we try and get the hardware to function in the way that we want it to.